from the Celebrator Beer News and the uh, Beer Paper LA, where I do a history uh, history of Los Angeles so brewing column. And um, big fan of Cascal. Very very excited. Um, a year ago or so, when I found out that um, Cascal uh, Brewery was going to be opening in Van Nuys and uh, Van Nuys of all places. And then I met Andy, had the beers, Jennifer, Alistair. That was a very it's amazing. Um, wild stuff, really great, really traditional. I love the uh, the historical uh, beers he's doing as well. So um, I just want to, um, in case you don't know, this is uh, this is Andy Black, uh, who, who's the uh, brewer here. He's doing, he's doing God's work. And uh, also, um, to, to his right is Evan Price from uh, Noble uh, Works in Anaheim. He's um, kind of a recent past convert after a trip to uh, the UK last year. Check, check. Okay, I mean, here I am, here I am. Um, yeah, uh, I like cast. <laughs> Man of many words. And uh, Victor Novak. Um, of Golden Road, formerly of TAPS, and um, Evan and Victor used to work together at TAPS uh, eons ago. Yeah, he was my boss. <laughs> exactly. So the, the, uh, the bruises have, uh, have disappeared. <laughs> right. So I think. So first of all, we'll start. I mean, I know you guys are all drinking it now, but how many of you are familiar with Cas Cascales and have had them before? Before you, before McLeod's open, how many have had them? Oh, and how many have had them overseas in, in England? Oh, right. Uh, good crowd. You brought your friends. Huh? You can get them with friends, too. Well, yeah, yeah, you can. And, and of course, in Germany, too. Uh, Bamberg. The, you know, the, uh, the, the smoke beers, the rock beers in Bamberg, and the, uh, especially the alt beers at, at Jurga and Dusseldorf, they're all served from wooden casks right on the bar. Really, make, really makes a difference. So it, it isn't, you know, even though we mostly know it as an English, Tradition and that and they're really the ones that kept the tradition most of Germany did not when they they pretty much You know um, went to lagers, but a lot of the uh, the older towns uh, with, with more old uh, brewing traditions of alt beer in fact means old beer in, um, in Dusseldorf there are there are still a lot of people using uh, casks and, and using them in the right traditional way so um, what I wanted to do is have Andy do a little bit of a, a rundown on just what cask beer is the way the uh, you know the tradition is, and, and how he is, um, you know, what he's doing with it to uh, preserve that. <laughs> In 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be the difference uh, to when we did it for the fest. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I would like to get across about Cascale is it is just it's just beer. Uh, it's the same as the everything that everyone else makes. Uh, it's not this crazy foreign thing. It's just that it has different parameters in the way that the beer is served. There's different kinds of beers that do better on cask. Uh, there's kinds of beers that don't do well on cask. Uh, triple IPA, it's cra crazy things. But then it's just like it is, some things work, some things don't. It's just, it's a way of serving beer. Uh, and it's something that I've been kind of ruminating on or uh, thinking about lately. It's just that it's kind of a, an X factor in beer now because it's an older style of beer service and it only makes, not, not only, but it makes a difference. Uh, okay. uh, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Grant. That's, Grant is the check on all of my uh, bombastic uh, yeah. business. Yeah. Assistant for the cloud. It's awesome. Uh, it means I can go home sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's, so uh, I'm still working on my ideas on this, but uh, it's it's a way of serving beer that is historical, traditional, and it makes a difference. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But it does something different. Never bad. Sometimes bad. Sometimes bad. Uh, a lot. I'm sure quite a few people having beer in California uh, have had bad casks, and it's a travesty. Um, and some people need to know. 
but uh, you know. Uh, okay, here. Yeah. Well, to each his own. My, my gear is terrible. Uh, <laughs> uh, it makes a difference, and we need to acknowledge that these traditional historical ways of serving beer make a significant difference. But they're not suitable in all cases, and it's just it's something that makes things different. It's compared to, compared to uh, the way that Anchor Brewing makes beer. That's it's different, it's special, and it needs to be acknowledged as something that makes beer special. Isn't it essentially just beer, ale primarily, that's gone through a natural secondary fermentation in the vessel from which it's served? I mean, that's kind of like the, the long and the short of it. <laughs> so whether you do it in a firkin, whether you do it in a pin, or whether you do it in a straight-sided sanky keg, where you, we used to do a taps, which is cut the spear, but we're still doing a natural secondary fermentation in that vessel from which it's dispensed, that basically is still real ale and cast ale. Am I pinging here? What is that? Um, but it, that's kind of the long... Now, camera, of yeah. course, has their rules about what it's... Um, how it's dispensed in terms of the... that What is that? Yeah. Um, I think it's you. Is it? It's just you. Is my head pinging? So, yes. We're, just, we're giving you feedback. Yeah. But, uh, what's that? You gotta get up on the mic? I think he's getting up. You have to eat the mic if I have uh, been told correctly. Yeah. Um, but that's basically it is, is if you, especially for your your IPAs, your pale ales. Irish red didn't work that well for us at task, but again, it's made up sound. Yeah, yeah. Natural secondary fermentation in that vessel from which it's dispensed, dispensed with a beer engine, whether you're using a cask for either or not. Uh, but that's basically kind of what cask for real ale is. It's softer, tends to soften the hops, bring out those beautiful esters if you're using like a really nice British strain and those fruity esters. Basically all those flavor and aroma compounds come out. The Brits tend to think our beer is too cold and too fizzy. And so we would serve ours at taps about in the actual kegerator at 55 degrees, cellar temp, uh, because if we're gonna put all that time and effort into making the beer taste great with the yeast character, malt character, hop character, you wanna taste those things. And basically think of it as red wine. You don't drink red wine out of the refrigerator. You let it warm up a little bit, let all those flavor and aroma compounds come out. And that's really kind of the essence of what real ale cascale is, is to let those beautiful malt, hop, yeast character uh, flavors come out. I agree. I, I can, <laughs> Kevin confirms. <laughs> That's what I should have said. Yeah. And of course, um, this, this is a traditional way because this is the way all beer was served before there was refrigeration and pressurized CO2. There weren't. Everything was um, it cooled and it was chilled in the cellar, 55 degrees cellar temperature. Cellars all over the UK, it's cold and wet and damp there. Um, and it's served at 55 degrees and, um, and it's served by gravity because there was really no other way to get it out. There was, there was, you couldn't pressurize gas. So the bearing one was invented. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the reason why Cascale is so fussy and people do it wrong is because it's the end of a long uh, process of technological development where the reason you have separate smiles, the reason you have all these special hand pumps and things is because they figured out how to do it right. So, that's kind of one thing that, that you know, it's it's not a low-tech method, it's just any kind of brewing technology, especially on the service side, is a compromise between m making money and making great beer. So I think that's that's why there is such renewed interest in it, because it works, it's great, and it's, you know, the, the end of 200 years, literally, of technological development, and there's still developments going on. So I think it's important to, to not think of it as like a primitive or you know inevitable version of uh, your team. The cool thing with Cascade Ben was Lang from Artisan Ales uh, distributor. Yes, no, that is true. But of course, it was it was the only way at one point, and it is all everything is a uh, is a compromise when when you when you're on the on the beer serving side, and that's why there's cask breathers and all things. But when people drank nothing but beer and you were just emptying those casks 
three or four of them a night. That's all people could drink. They were only drinking beer, and you never had any problem with it getting stale because it never lasted longer than it took to tap the entire thing, pint after pint. But we, thankfully, we have this tradition, and, and um, we have uh, brewers that are doing it, and um, you know we have a, a brewery that's pretty much dedicated entirely to it. So that's great. So Evan, um, you um, you were playing with casks before your trip to the UK, and you know you were using it like a lot of uh, a lot of people do, particularly in Southern California. I guess we tend to call it the California cask, where they use uh, the cask more as a randall. If you know what a randall is, it's something you pump the uh, beer from your tap through, whether it's got coffee beans or hops or cherries or whatever in it, and then into the, into the glass. So um, it's yeah, kind of like a, like, a, like a water filter with a bunch of ingredients into it. And so like Dogfish Head is really um, one of the breweries that came up with this idea of pushing beer through a, uh, a device stuffed with uh, hops or you know vanilla or coffee or whatever else and so when it ends up in your glass you get something different than what's in the keg. Um, yeah, at, at Noble we started out doing these cask Fridays where we would do, um, when I started there a little over three years ago, we would put anything and everything into that cask. Um, one of my favorites was uh, uh, fresh lime juice and uh, and the shells and coconuts uh, with our naughty sauce, which is this golden milk stout that we do, and um, totally rad like shandy beer. Um, but we've moved away from doing that kind of stuff, and um, if you come into Noble these days, you'll have a. Uh, we have a cask on all the time. It's uh, we have one. Um, it's served at 55 degrees. It's uh, it's been um, conditioned into the uh, the vessel from which it's served, and um, it's lightly carbonated. And um, I've been really excited about making uh, English beers uh, ever since uh, a recent trip that my wife and my lead brewer and his wife went to England and got really excited about actually trying to make something traditional for the first time in my life. Like, uh, I've been so excited about trying to go against the grain for so long. Uh, and, uh, even working with Victor at Taps, where it was always like, ah, eh, yeah, it's cool, man, but it's it's traditional. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. I'm like, yeah, but I mean, it, but it's it's an Irish red. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's, <laughs> you know, so he's like overly he's excited. Now he is. <laughs> So he's like, you know, like the, so like the, we would butt heads on this like whole idea of like, uh, you know, Victor would be like, yeah, this is traditional. This is, this is rad because of this thing. And I'm like, yeah, well, in my opinion, it's not rad because it's, you know, I want to do something new and um, I've kind of tried these different things and now I've kind of come all the way back around to like, well, I just kind of really want to make a rad classic English pale ale. Uh, drink the fuck out of it and like just have this just have this beer that you can have glass after glass after glass of it and there's something so beautiful and interesting in that and uh, you know it's just there's a time and place for all things you know there's a we got a you know I love adding weird ingredients to any one of our beers as well uh, but you know I think that there's got to be uh, you got to separate the two and there's and then uh, Doing these beers on cask has been a really fun um, direction for us as a brewery to just enjoy something the way that it's a, maybe nah, not supposed to be, but some people could say that. Originally intended. Originally intended. <laughs> you can see I worked for him. So uh, Evan, how do how do um, the uh, the drinkers at Nobles? Uh, tasting room, how are they going for these traditional beers? You know, I can't say that they love them. Uh, I can't say that. One, like, you know, it's taken us almost a year to figure out how we're going to make these beer styles because uh, we have, you know, started in one direction of like, all right, we're gonna make beers that are sort of like a, a nod to English beers, um, but with a lot of American influence. We're gonna use American ingredients and then as time has gone on and I continue to be uh, upset with every batch uh, We continue to go more towards like making using all English ingredients um, For the most part other than of course the water and uh, I don't know that's been more fulfilling to me personally with like 
the only other place that I know to get beers like I've had in England is at McLeod. Um, I don't know what that noise is, but it's... Oh, it's a pig! Oh, I love the pig! Watch your serve. Biggie, 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 biggie. Uh, so I've been following that thing around, trying to take a good picture of it all day, and I, uh, I, it hasn't worked out so well. Uh, but anyway, I forgot where I was going, but that's it. And so, uh, Victor, I have a question. Um, you are uh, from your early days. Yes. If anyone's worried about the pig noise now... It's okay. Rosie just... The pig is okay, everyone. You, you can take the ASPCA off your uh, quick dial. The pig is fine. What about the green? That's right. So, Victor, um, from your early days, you, was it uh, Dock Street? You were out in Philly? Dock Street. Were, were you doing... Um, were you doing cast beer then? Was we were, yeah. Really? So I trained under. What years were they? Um, I worked at Dock Street from 93 to early 97. Wow. Trained under a guy named Nick Fennell. He was an English brewmaster for some small little breweries in uh, Grand Metropolitan Breweries in London. And so we were doing cast a little bit differently. Uh, again, this is coming from an English brewmaster. We weren't doing them in Perkins and Pins. We were doing them in straight-sided Sankey kegs. What are you laughing at? I, no, I, 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 <laughs> I need to read your bio. They wouldn't hire me. What's that? I'm here because they wouldn't hire me. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, so Doc Street didn't, my phone calls, they didn't yeah. hire Andy, uh, so now he works in the cloud. Their, their loss is our gain. So. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, what I was, I continued that at TAP, so basically we would take a uh, straight-sided Sankey, we would clip the, uh, the valve a couple of inches and rack the beer in. Uh, and basically, the end of fermentation, there's enough yeast in suspension to do that natural secondary fermentation in the keg slash cask. And then it would sit for about a week, uh, warm, roughly about 70 degrees, room temp. And then we would put it on in a, uh, back then at Dog Street, we just put it in a tub of water, just enough ice to kind of keep it about 55 degrees, and then dispense it through a beer engine. So it was still real ale. It wasn't camera because it wasn't in a firkin or a pin. But um, even some of the British breweries now, they have something called a thimble that goes on the bottom of the valve or the spear for a keg, and you can actually make real ale um, in the same way we were doing at Dog Street and, and, and Taps. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in a firkin. It's cool because, again, you're kind of priming up the sugar and adding yeast, but there is enough yeast and suspension to kind of make it real ale that way. So. I do the same exact thing. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why did they not use why didn't you use a cast? Could they not get them or did they not want them? It was more the way that it was sitting right behind the bar and and same uh, idea, taps, it was going, we wanted to serve it at the right temperature at 55 degrees, so we put it in a kegerator. Well, a firkin or a pin is very difficult to put in a kegerator sideways, so um, we just simply used a straight-sided Sankey keg and dispensed it with a coupler. Uh, we had a, a, a number of British people come in, say it's, it's very traditional cask ale, because again, it does that nat natural secondary fermentation in that vessel, and it was just, it, uh, it was pretty tasty. So. We've messed with the same thing, and we haven't even cut this. Needed to cut the sankey out. Uh, can't cut the spear. We just hooked it up straight up to our cast lines, and then we just pull through all the yeast. And, and uh, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, Bob's your uncle. Yeah. <laughs> Stainless steel. Stainless. Yeah, the wooden casts are really rare. Like it, you just you have to employ like a full time. Oh man! That will supply when, I, when I was in England, we went to a, we went to a, a, a pub that had it was like a Samuel Smith pub, and it had oak. Uh, had an ESB from an oak cask, and it was a pretty surreal experience. Um, in this Alms House, and uh, you know you could pick up all these old English writers that are writing in there, and uh, during this visit, and anyway, that was there's all yeah you can still do an oak cask, but not a lot of people have them. There's like this bizarre beer club in the U.S. I can't remember where it's based, but it's like one of the oldest beer clubs in the U.S. That's the this Society of for the Preservation of Beer from the Wood. That's Actually, like to the U.K. No, no, no. It's in the U.S. It's well, I know. The US well, I know the guys in the U.K. Here. Okay. Well, there's one. There's one in the U.S. It's one of the oldest like uh, consumer advocacy groups in the, in the U.S. for beer. 
and I mean it's only like 19 like 60s maybe but right, like right. it's still like because it's kind of like it's Cascale and then it has to be Cascale from a wooden cast. Like, was there actually any wood character though? Because when I trained under Nick, again my English brewmaster, he said that if, if British brewers got wood character, oak character out of the cast, they'd be mortified. I mean, the it same was thing actually very neutral. Well, yeah. yeah, so you're not really looking for oak character in that wood, you're looking for it's like simply a micro oxidation, I think. Yeah. So well, I was actually yeah. Just reading about that in this great book called uh, Amber, Gold, and Black by Martin Cornell. It's about the history of the great British beer styles. Amazing stuff. I thought I knew a lot. I learned so much. But it talks about that society, and it wasn't a wood flavor. They weren't objecting because of the wood flavor. It was just a sort of modernization of it. They didn't, you know, it was just it was just on principle. It wasn't on what it did to the beer. You know? I, I love this book. I picked up this book, and you guys should all check it out. Uh, when, I have an off, when I'm having a hard time sleeping, I get about a page or two in, and I immediately fall asleep. It's, uh, it works every time. Uh, but I am entertained for one page as I'm feeling as feel, falling asleep on the second page. Works out really well. Anyway, yeah, I'm the worst reader. Question down there. What? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I'm, I really don't know the difference. Is two two questions. Um, the difference between a cask and a firkin is it size? Ca ca uh, the cask is just sort of a general <laughs> shape and setup of a what do you call it, bulk beer storage container. So there's kegs. Right? And there are different size designations of kegs. There's, I mean, every kind of region has its own sort of size designation. But it's like six barrel, quarter barrel, half barrel, um, that kind of thing. Those are all different sizes of kegs, and they'll just be referred to as six doles, half barrels, quarters, that kind of thing. Uh, and a cask is just a, a general designation of a packaging type. So it means that there are basically that there. The way that the beer out, uh, the beer gets out, is different from the way that gas enters uh, the vessel, or like air uh, enters the vessel. There's like a there's a chive on the top and a keystone on the bottom. That just makes it a cask. And then a firkin is a 10.8 gallon cask. So and then there's pins, which are 5.4 gallons, filter pins that are oh god uh 18 something like that and i'm trying to remember uk sizes and then there's hogs heads and it goes up and up from there yeah. and it's then huh? oh, oh yeah all those like crazy barrel names and whatnot uh, and, a, and a butt yeah it, at one point they were they were regularly sending casts out to pubs in england that were over a hundred gallons in volume i don't know how they transported them well, I, yes, uh, smart uh, Well, how they got them in the cellar, because I've been to English cellars, there's like a hole, and you just roll the cask and it just falls 15 feet. <laughs> so, 100 gallons of beer on the floor, possibly. Well, we do have some primitive um, uh, dumb waiters. I was in the uh, star, dumb waiters. star Inn. Yeah, exactly. The Star Inn in, um, in Bath, uh, and where they still serve uh, Bass Ale on casks, and uh, we were lucky, we were lucky enough to be stuck in a lock-in there, where you know it closes at 11, and uh, he just kept serving his beers till about three, and then walked us back to our hotel. But it was amazing, and he let us he let us change the cask and use the um, the old dumbwaiter, and the thing goes back to the it's like the first one of the first pubs in the UK, maybe one of Bath's earliest pubs. Um, and so the other thing I was wondering, what types of beers do not lend themselves to being, you know, cast? Cream ale. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're gonna try that out actually. Are oh, you really? Yeah. yeah. We started test batching in cream ale. It was it was really cool. I feel like uh, generally speaking, like high ABV beers are not meant for cask. Um, generally speaking, I I feel like beers below. Um, six percent, which I think is still, you know, high to British standards, and uh, below five percent, maybe alcohol content, um, are utilized best on cask. 
Because, like, for me, I mean, I'm all, I, I really appreciate the drinking experience when it comes to cask, where you can have, where the, the intent is to drink, I mean, in my mind, drink low alcohol content beers, one after another, after another, after another, after another, uh, and etc. Um, uh, you know, I mean, and it's still, you know, um, be able to walk, not fumble home, and, and you know, like, have a good morning. Uh, so that's, I don't know, there, there's that's a, my happy space. There's a relationship of alcohol content and carbonation level that makes a beer seem heavy or light or thin. Um, and Caskill only, especially, the service or beer engine specifically, has only one real carbonation level that is acceptable. Um, that you have to hit for the beer for well. And so some beers aren't able to be served at that low of a carbonation level and still seem good. Whereas uh, low low carbonation beers, uh, or um, low alcohol beers, excuse me, uh, and typically lower IBU levels too, um, serve better on cast because of those those restrictions. Gravity is a, a gravity cast um, service like we're doing today for all our guest beers is a little bit more flexible because of the way the beer is being poured. You can have a slightly higher uh, carbonation level, so you can have slightly higher alcohol content. But you know, on the one hand, it's definitely down to the beer. Like we're serving a very strong beer that I think is actually doing pretty well on cast generally. Uh, but maybe it's just a lighter beer um, overall in terms of its flavor perceptions, or it's okay to drink heavier beer. Uh, but there are some beers that are, by kind of definition, need a lightness to them, even though they have very high alcohol content. So, like an Imperial Scout, maybe you could, if it's a certain way, you could uh, definitely get away with it. Everything's situation dependent. But a triple IPA, that one's really, really heavy. It's a bit syrupy, it's a bit uncomfortable, but who knows? Emerald uh, uh, Yum Yum might be uh, the next big Cascale. The things I find that work really well with cask or beers with yeast character, the things I find that Evan and, and Andy are doing really well are these British styles. One thing I look for in cask ale, whether it's here or in England, is yeast character. Um, these fruity esters that are coming out from the Timmy Taylor's yeast or the London, um, the uh, Fuller's strain are fantastic on cask. The other things that work really well are malt character. So if you have some of your darker beers, your dark milds and some of your maybe oatmeal stouts, that, that darker malt character tends to lend itself. What is Guinness trying to do with nitrogenation? Somewhat replicate uh, cast conditioned beer, right? Nitrogen is not a natural byproduct of fermentation, it's CO2. So they're somewhat replicating that cast conditioned experience with nitrogen. So it works great for dark beers, yeast character, and then hop character to a degree, but a lot of the British beers, as we know, are not very hoppy. So just enough hop character to, to meld with that beautiful yeast character is fantastic. Right, and I found, I found too that um, the big, dense uh, hoppy beers, double IPAs, triple IPAs, really dank, it, it just doesn't work. It, it needs much more carbonation to make those, open up those hops sort of in the flavor. It just sort of just sits there when, it, when it's a, um, you know, uh, cast carbonation, I think. Yeah, we, uh, at Noble, we make, uh, we make a lot of double IPAs, and we make some triple IPAs, and, um, yeah, I think a high carbonation level is really needed for those beer styles in order to uh, have a lighter perception because there is a lot of body to those beers. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, we we I, I want those beers cold and carbonated, uh, fully, um, high CO two volumes and very cold. And um, and I think that perception, uh, that drinking experience, being, ends up being really nice. Um, and so, for me personally, like, you know, when it comes to uh, British beers, you know, I, I want them a certain way. When it comes to German beers, I want them a certain way, and American beers, and so on and so forth. So it's like, um, I can't, I'm not the guy that's going to, you know, cask is not a catch-all for me where, you know, everything needs to be served a certain way. Just some things uh, will end up being a more pleasant drinking experience. I'm going to politely disagree on some of the hop stuff. Cause uh, the double IPA, triple IPA, uh, and the IPA is generally the higher alcohol content. Of it. It, you know, it, it isn't a catch-all for things, but I think there's a different type of expression of hop character on cast that still makes 
hop forward alcohol content appropriate beers really really expressive on cask in a different way like we've got the um el segundo's mayberry idea that's just throwing a really exceptional hop character and even just tapping some of the old beers the the session ipa um, and trying some of that is just throwing some really exceptional hop character that isn't quite as soft and expressive and well melded um, with a, a co2 version um, the, hop, the malt is definitely coming forward. It's not the hops aren't as punchy in your face, for sure. You can see that point for sure. Um, but there is a way that hops are expressed on the pass that uh, it's definitely not a write-off for a hop forward here. If you ever have a chance, definitely try a cask condition beer, the exact same beer on cask and on CO2. It's an entirely different experience. It softens the hop character, brings up the malt character a little bit, and it does just soften the palate, which can work, or if you want that big hop pop, then you go for the CO2. If you want it softer and a little more integrated, then go for the cask we, we kind of have again, that right just, now. What's that? We kind of have that on right now. Yeah. So, um, our, it's amazing. Our ordinary bitter, which isn't the most hop forward beer, but it's more hop forward than probably a lot of the more traditional English bitters. Um, so we have that very traditional uh, no CO2 purge uh, fill um, on beer engine, and then we have it, um, it's, just, it's, it's nitro, but it's still being uh, served in a clean gas uh, way that's on the outside bar. So if you want, do want to get a side-by-side, -side, it is more hot forward beer, so you be able to kind of really feel that these tank holdings um, bubbles. I like those hops. <laughs>